And turn to Exodus chapter 12. Uh, it's good to have you if you're visiting with us. Uh, I know a lot of people traveling this Labor Day weekend, uh, a lot of people from the church traveling. So I uh, hope you guys have a, a great time with family and friends if you're visiting. But uh, we come to the 10th and uh, the final plague that God sends upon Egypt. And this would be the most gut-wrenching plague of all. Uh, God will now bring judgment the judgment of death against the firstborn child within every home of all the Egyptians, including Pharaoh's firstborn son, who would be the heir to the throne. And, and, you know, we all know that God is loving, He's gracious, He's compassionate, He's merciful, but He is also a God that is very righteous, and He will bring judgment. He is a God of justice and wrath. So there is no gray area with the Lord. You are either for God or you're against Him. you either saved or you're not saved. You're either going to heaven or you will end up in the lake of fire. There's no gray area with the Lord. And it all depends on whether or not you are in Christ or if you are not in Christ. And we'll talk more about that. So what we're about to see is simply the result of God doing exactly what he said he was going to do to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians if they continued to reject the word of the Lord. And as we've seen, God gave him every opportunity to do the right thing. As we've also seen with the first five plagues, uh, it says har Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The next five, the last five, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart because he refused to let the Israelites leave Egypt, go out into the wilderness, and worship the Lord. Now, Satan loves to use sections of Scripture like this to try to smear God, try to paint God as being this mean, old, nasty, uncaring, unsympathetic, brutal taskmaster that is just waiting for you to step out of line so he can smack you upside the head with a two-by-four. That's not God at all. In fact, everything Satan accuses God of being, Satan actually is. At the same time, God is sovereign. God is God. He is the creator and sustainer of life. And God is the one who made the rules. He's the one who sets the standards. So we can either live life God's way or we can do things our way. We can either be blessed tremendously by living for Jesus, or we will face the consequences if we continue to make bad choices. It's only when people know the truth of who God is and the plans and purposes He has for our lives that we can come to realize that God loves us, God is for us, He, he wants to give us and give you eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Uh, keep that in mind as we go through this, uh, in some ways, a horrific section of Scripture. But, you know, Paul summarizes this whole thing in uh, Romans 6.23, where it tells us on the screen there, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we all deserve, because I worked hard as a sinner. My wages is death. But, here's the good news, the gift of God, and it literally means the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you can continue to work hard at sinning, and you'll receive the wage that you deserve, which is death, separation from God. Or you can humble yourself before the Lord, surrender your life to Him, and He will give you the free gift of everlasting life. Well, look at verse 29. This is where we pick up in Exodus chapter 12. This is the tenth and final plague. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So what a brutal scene this is. Death struck every household in Egypt. As you know, death is not a respecter of persons. As we talked about last week, not a single Israelite would die this night because they 
took God's word seriously. They applied the blood of the lamb to the header and the two doorposts in their homes. And that's what Passover means. When the death angel came that night and passed over the houses that saw blood on the doors, everybody was spared. No blood on the doors. Then the firstborn was killed instantly. For us who are saved by Christ, we will never even taste death. Not now, not ever, because Jesus has conquered death for us. Um, yes, we will die physically, but nobody dies in Christ spiritually. You who are dead in your trespasses and sins, he made alive together with Christ. Ephesians 2.1. That simply means we were all dead before Jesus saved us, and he caused us to be born again. That's what it means. Spiritual death, separation from God. Before I was saved, I was dead. I was like a walking zombie in this life, doing my own thing, living for my flesh. But then once Christ comes into your life, then he brings you to life. So as a believer, we will never experience death or separation from God. Even when we physically die, our spirit instantly goes to be with the Lord. John chapter 11, verse 25, this is where Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And so again, we are saved by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Again, if you reject God's grace, then you'll face his justice and you'll certainly get what you deserve which is eternal separation away from the presence and the goodness and the grace of God. Now, our world today especially is always crying out for justice. I encourage you, don't pray for God to give you justice. I don't want what I deserve. So we are under grace. The world wants justice, and unfortunately our justice system is failing in so many ways. Um, too often we see the guilty go free, and we see those who didn't commit a crime locked up. In our government, Lady Justice is supposed to be blind. In other words, everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what their background, no matter what their skin color, no matter what their econo economic status, Lady Justice is to be blind. In other words, we should all be treated fairly and equally, but too often that is not the case. By the way, what's the difference between organized crime and our government? Our government is not organized. <laughs> That's pretty simple. But this should remind us that there is a higher court than our Supreme Court, and that is the Lord, God himself. He will righteously judge every nation and individual perfectly, including America. Jesus says that the Father has turned all judgment over to him. Now, even Thomas Jefferson, who <laughs> has some questionable beliefs, but he said this concerning America. I indeed tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. If he said that 250 years ago, man, what would he say today? That's exactly what Egypt experienced on that fateful, dreadful night so many years ago, the death of every firstborn throughout their land. Now again, God had been very patient with Pharaoh. He had been very patient with the Egyptian people because they were also guilty. They had been mistreating the Jewish people. They had been throwing baby Jews into the Nile River so not only had they abused them as slaves, but they had killed many innocent children. They had tortured, they had killed many of the Jews, and Egypt became very wealthy off of the Jews' suffering and misery and slavery. And that's why this tenth plague here affected every household throughout the land of Egypt. It didn't have to go this far. Pharaoh could have humbled himself. Pharaoh could have just obeyed the word of the Lord God. And when we look at this example of God's justice, it should be obvious that his justice is known as fitting justice. Pharaoh drowned many Hebrew babies in the Nile River. Pharaoh's army will be drowned in the Red Sea. 
Pharaoh killed many of the Hebrew sons, so his firstborn son would be killed. The Egyptians terrorized the Jews and caused them to cry out to God. But on this night, they are going to be crying out, not to God, but they're just crying out because of the death and despair everyone faced there in Egypt. The Egyptians had gotten rich off the labor of Jewish slavery. But on this day, the Jews are going to leave, as we'll see, with great wealth, with gold and silver and clothing that the Egyptians gave them. Through it all, God was keeping his promise to his people that he would rescue them, he would deliver them, he would bring them out of bondage and take them to the promised land. So for the Jewish people, this was an extreme example, like Paul tells us in Romans 8.21, where all things work together for good. To those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. So all things are working together for their good, for God's glory at this time. Someone once said, God can turn a mess into a message. He can turn a test into a testimony. He can turn a trial into a triumph. And he can turn a victim into a victorious Christian. And so what God does here in Egypt is just another great example of what he will ultimately do in the last days here. When we're gone and the great tribulation comes on the scene, he will judge this world. So Egypt is like a microcosm of what God was going to do in the near future. Look at verse 31. Then he, this is Pharaoh, he called for Moses and Aaron by night. So this happened at midnight, and so he is just so distraught. He calls immediately for Moses and Aaron and said, Rise, go out from among the people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also? That's kind of a weird statement. I mean, isn't that strange? Bless me also? It's almost as if Pharaoh wants to be rewarded for finally admitting that the God of the Hebrews is superior to his pagan gods. But as we'll see, his heart has not changed at all. A lot of people will have remorse for what they've done, but they're not truly repentant. His heart has not changed. As we'll see, uh, when he'll, you know, later on he's going to wake up, come to us, say, what did we do? Why did we let them go? And he's going to send his army to try to annihilate every Jewish person. But here, at this moment, he says, get out of here, leave me, flee, just like you said, but bless me also. Weird. Verse 20, uh, 33. And the Egyptians urged the people... That means they, like, please get out of here. I mean, they're urging them, you got to leave, please. We don't all want to die. Because that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened. Remember their bread dough that was supposed to be unleavened. Having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So again, word quickly spreads among all the Egyptians that Pharaoh finally said, let the people go. And so they urged the slaves to leave. And by this point, all the Egyptians feared the God of the Hebrews. They didn't know if this was going to be the last plague. They know this is the tenth plague, but they're thinking, man, if there's another one, we're all going to be dead. Again, all this could have been avoided if Pharaoh wasn't so stinking stubborn. So as Moses instructed, was instructed by God earlier, he tells his fellow Jews, Ask the Egyptians, all your neighbors, for gold, silver, and clothing. And so they just heap all this gold, all this silver, all these different utensils and things, clothing. And so, again, you've got about, I believe, close to 3 million Israelites leaving at this time. All these things packed on their backs. I mean, it must have been like the biggest backpacking trip of all time. This big caravan, the sea of people leaving Egypt with all this plunder. Now, in Psalm 105, 
verse 37 and 38, it kind of summarizes this scene when it says, He also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. In other words, even the elderly people, God gave them supernatural strength for this journey. And so they're all loaded down with all these with all the stuff, you know, and they're just taking it out of Egypt with them. So God said there was none feeble among his tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them. And look at verse 37. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Now, Ramses is in the land of Goshen. That's one of the cities that we're told that the Jews pretty much built as slaves. And Succoth, there's a few different ones. So if you Google how far is it from Ramses to Succoth, some will say 110 miles. No, this is about 15 miles away. This is where they would flee this first day. Now, in numbers, 600,000 men. We'll see that number used often in Exodus and it refers to 600,000 men who are 20 years old and above. So most all these guys would be married. Most all these guys would have kids. And so just do the math, and it's very easily close to 3 million people that are fleeing at this time. Verse 38, a mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock. Now, this phrase, mixed multitudes, we'll see this come up, and it's not a good phrase. It's mostly mentioned in the book of Numbers. And most of the time, the mixed multitudes, is, it's a reference to those who were half Egyptian, half Jewish. That was the mixed multitudes. There were some other tribes or people groups that were slaved by the Egyptians, and so they looked at this as their get-out-of-jail-free card. The Jews are leaving. Let's go, too. So that was part of it, but the majority were half Egyptian and half Jewish. We will see that they represent compromise. In other words, they will have one foot in Egypt and one foot in the things of Israel. Very similar to a lot of people in churches today. They have one foot in the world, and they'll stick their foot in church from time to time just to make sure they're on the, you know, God's good side, so to speak. But as we'll see with the mixed multitudes, they will be the troublemakers among the Jewish people. They will constantly be grumbling and complaining about everything that they will face in the uh, wilderness wanderings. They will get the Jews stirred up and get them grumbling and complaining. And this will cause Moses all kinds of grief and headaches. I'm sure he had to go through quite a few bottles of Excedrin because Moses will be very, very upset by what these mixed multitudes will do. Now, even though they outwardly identified with the Jewish people, they were not genuine followers of the Lord. There are a lot of people in every church. Well, I'll say there's a few people in every church. Some churches, there's a lot of people in, every, you know, in churches. They're Christian in name only. I mean, I, I just blown away by some churches and the things they do, the things they practice, and the things they get involved with. And it's like, that has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Jesus described this type of person in Matthew 7, starting in verse 21, when Jesus says, and these are sobering words, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, those who are still living according to their flesh. By the way, there are mixed multitudes all around us, I would say in every church, they're calling themselves Christians, but God sees the truth. They're not born again. They don't have a relationship with God. They don't know Christ personally, but they'll go to church and they'll give themselves the label Christian. I'm not to judge who that is, but God sees the heart. 
There are a lot of so-called Christian experts today. They say that Christian churches, we should all accommodate all the unbelievers in our churches. In other words, never offend them, never speak about sin, don't talk about repentance, don't talk about the cross, those things are bloody, those things are messy, don't talk about surrendering and sacrifice, and certainly don't talk about prophecy because you might scare some people. Make them feel comfortable because that's our job as the church. That is baloney. That is wrong. That's not the job of the church. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 tells us what the role of the church is. He gave some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. That's the number one reason why we're here. The Apostle Paul tells us this is where we gather together to worship the Lord. This is where we study God's Word. This is where we encourage. Acts 2.42, they were in the Apostles' doctrine, God's Word. Breaking bread, fellowship, prayer. That's what the church is all about. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul calls the church the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. And so if we say, well, we're not going to teach these truths because we don't want to offend people, then the church is doing a disservice. This place should be as different as light and darkness in comparison to the world. And it's our difference that should make us attractive to the world. The world is hopeless. We have answers. And that's why we got to keep pointing people to Jesus and to the Word of God. They're looking for something different. And what a disservice we do as churches if we want to be just like the world to make the world comfortable in God's house. That's an abomination in the sight of the Lord. We have hope. We have forgiveness. We have genuine love. We have salvation found in Christ. So keep an eye out for this phrase, mixed multitudes as we go through the scriptures. Notice it also says here that they had flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock. Uh, we'll see later on most of this, well, much of this livestock will be used when God starts requiring the sacrifices after they build the tabernacle. Look at verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. And so this is when they first eat the unleavened bread. This is after Passover. Remember, the next seven days are the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this is the next day's journey, not 110 miles. It was about 15 miles that they fled from Ramses to Succoth. Verse 40. Now, the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Again, I chuckle because he says all the armies? The, Egypt, or the Jews here, they'd never fought. They'd never held a weapon. They didn't have any training, and yet God sees the end from the beginning. So the armies go out. What I think it's referring to is, remember, for many, many years before uh, Moses fled Egypt, he was one of the commanders of the Egyptian army. And so when it says they left his army, he probably had it all very organized. So don't picture two or three million people just, ah, running and screaming and all scattered like cats. No, they were probably very organized as he got them leaving the land of Egypt. That's probably what it's referring to there. It says, it is a night, verse 42, of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. A couple of things to take note of here in these verses. First of all, it says the sojourn of the children of Israel was 430 years. The word sojourn means length of stay. In other words, their length of stay was 430 years. Some places will say 400 years. A couple places say 430 years. We just saw in Genesis 15, or yeah, Genesis 15 verse 13, God told Abraham they would be there 400 years. Um, when uh, Stephen, 
when he's about to be stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, this is what he says about it, Acts 7 verse 6. But God spoke in this way that his descendants, Abraham's descendants, would dwell in a foreign land and that they would uh, bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Now, the reason I bring this for some of you, it might be trivial, 430 or 400 years, because people in the world will say, this is a contradiction right there. You have a contradiction of God's word. They say 400, they say 430, so they don't have a right? What's the problem here? Well, if you do some simple digging, there's no contradiction at all. Their sojourn, that length of stay, was 430 years. Very simple. Their bondage and their affliction started at 400 years, and it got worse and worse over those 400 years. The first 30 years, they had peace. They were there when Jacob was there. Joseph was overseeing everything. When King Solomon began his work in the temple, this is what we're told in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, that's what we just read, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. The fourth year of King Solomon was 966 B.C. You go back 480 years, the Jewish exodus was 446 B.C. 430 years earlier was when Jacob and his family moved into Egypt because Joseph called them to come down there. That was 876 B.C. So the Israelites, again, they had 30 years of peace in Egypt, and then after Joseph died, the next pharaoh didn't remember Joseph. In other words, I don't care what they did for us. We're now going to start enslaving them. So for 400 years, they were enslaved. It wasn't bad at the beginning, but it got really, really bad towards the end. So be that as it may, this journey that they're now going to take, when they leave Egypt, they're only two weeks away from the promised land. It's not like they're going around the world but it's going to take them 40 years to get into the promised land. A two-week journey turns into 40 years out there in the boonies. But by the time they're done, God is going to transform them in, from being slaves to being strong soldiers, strong warriors for God. When they come into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, they're going to be leading the charge. They're going to be leading the attacks. They're going to be you know, taking these armies from each of the tribes, and they're going to defeat the enemies of God. Now, this should be true for all of us as well. We were delivered from bondage to slavery. We're now in process. None of us are perfect. We're still growing in the Lord, but we should be developing skills in the Lord. We should be developing uh, faith, strengthening our faith in the Lord, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We should be entering into battles for the souls of men and women, boys and girls that don't know the Lord. And we do that through the sharing of the gospel. And so we need to be growing in these things as an army. I mean, the Apostle Paul tells us that, that you know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, right? And he says in 2 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And even though these Israelites don't realize it at this moment, the Lord is going to prepare them. He is going to equip them for some amazing battles in the future. Now again, as verse 42 points out, this was a sober and solemn night. You would think the Jews would be leaving going, Woohoo! We're free! No longer slaves! Not this night. Why? Because as they're leaving, what are they hearing? They're hearing weeping. They're hearing crying. They're, they know the firstborn of all these Egyptians are dead. Some experts say up to a million Egyptians died this night. I mean, that's incredible to think of. It was a sober, it was a solemn night 
And the Bible is clear. God does not desire for anyone to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. He wants all people to turn to him. Don't think God is here, you know, with a two by four wanting to strike you over the head because you're a sinner. Now, Jesus was nailed to that cross for your sins. That's how he demonstrated his love for you. He's not here to condemn you, but he wants to save you. You'll condemn yourself if you continue to rebel against the Lord. But God tells Ezekiel, this is Ezekiel 33, 11. And this is when God's own people, the Jews, had been turning their back on the Lord many years later. And, and God tells Ezekiel, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? God wasn't taking pleasure over the death of all these Egyptians. But again, Pharaoh brought this upon his own nation because of his stubborn, hard, rebellious heart against the Lord. And at the same time, the Israelites did not know where they were going. I mean, they're just leaving, and they don't know what's ahead. They don't know it yet, but they're starting on a great, miraculous journey with their God, Yahweh. But again, so are we. When we got saved, God began a whole new relationship with you. When you got saved, God began a new work in your life. Sin was destroying you, but God. God miraculously intervened, and by His grace, He graciously forgave you. He freely has given you eternal life. And again, what an amazing journey we are on. We're walking with the Creator of the universe. That, that blows my mind. And here's something crazy to think about. Again, they were only two weeks away from the promised land. Someone once said, it took only one night to get the Israelites out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, it took one moment in time where God saved you. He came into your life. He, he caused you to be born again. Don't spend the rest of your life just stumbling and bumbling along. He wants you to be sold out to Him. You know, before you get down on yourself or before you get down on uh, the Israelites or even the Egyptians, you know, think, do, do you ever get frustrated with yourself? Do you ever get discouraged with your own actions? It's... It's a drag, but man, I've been a Christian over 45 years now, and I thought I'd be a little bit further along than I am. And I still catch myself thinking, I can't believe I did that, Lord. I can't believe I'm still struggling in this area, God. I thought by now these things would be behind me. I can't believe I'm so stupid. But here's the awesome thing to remember about God, is that He is faithful even when we're not. God will finish what he started in your life. So don't let the enemy beat you down any further than you beat yourself down. You need to just humble yourself, come back to the Lord, and realize his ways are higher than your ways. His plans are better than your plans. He knows what's best for you. Here's a couple verses that I encourage you to write down. Hold on to these. Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author, so he started it, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he started this work in your life. He will complete it, right? Philippians 1.6, one of my favorite verses, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul says to the Colossians, you are complete in Christ. That's your position in Christ. You're as saved as you'll ever be. You're as forgiven as you'll ever be because you are in Christ. But we are also in process. That's the sanctification, sanctification process. I'm not what I used to be. When I was a baby Christian, man, I said and did all kinds of stupid things. And I'm like, man, how did those Christians put up with me? And then there's people who say, how does Pastor Jeff put up with me? <laughs> because they're a baby Christian. No, because we're in process. He who began a good work in you, 
He's the one that will complete it. When is that completion done? The sanctification process? When I kick the bucket? When I die? When the rapture takes place? Then this mortal will put on immortality. Then this body of corruption will put on incorruption. I may fail, you may fail, but God never fails. And he never gives up on us. And I guarantee that any flaws that you and I have, and I still have flaws, any flaws we have at the end of our life, it'll be taken care of by Jesus. Again, when we die or at the rapture. Only then will this mortal put on immortality. Look at verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. But every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. Talk about being dedicated to the Lord. Oh, I believe in you, God. Do you really? Yeah, I really do. Okay. Circumcision. Oh, wait a minute. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, speaking of the Passover lamb, nor shall you break one of its bones. Notice no bones could be broken with the Passover lamb. This is actually a prophecy dealing with Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb. Remember, he's hanging on the cross, two thieves, one on each side of him. The, the religious leader said, we got to get him down because Passover is going to start at sunset. we got to get him down before then. So about 3 o'clock, they go to the thieves, take a basically a club, break their legs because that would cause them to instantly collapse and they could no longer push up on that cross or the beam where their feet were. And so they would quickly suffocate. They come to Jesus, getting ready to break his legs, but he was already dead. So what's the centurion do? His spear up into his heart outpours blood and water. So not one bone of the Messiah broken, just as God's word says here. Look at verse 47. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land. So there is hope for the foreigner. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Thus all the children of Israel did. As the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies." So again, here God lays out the rules for participating in the Passover feast. Again, because of the mixed multitudes, God had to make it very clear. So God says there's one law for everybody. What was that one law? Well, you first of all had to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then as evidence of your belief, you would be circumcised. That was his requirement. Whether you were a Jew or a foreigner, you could not partake in Passover unless you converted and believed in God and then got circumcised. Now that was the proof of being committed to the God of Israel. Circumcision, as many of you know, speaks of cutting away of the flesh and then walking after the Spirit. Cutting away the things that are holding you back and walking in the newness of life in the Lord. Everybody, as we see here, everybody was welcome to come to God. But again, you had to come to God on His terms, not on your own terms. You know, too many people think, well, I'll come to God, but I still want to hold on to all this stuff, talking about sinful things. And God says, no, you got to let go of these things. You can't come to me on your terms. You have to come to me on my terms. We have two ordinances as Christians. Communion and baptism. Who, are, who can partake in communion and baptism? They're not religious rituals. Only believers can come to God and partake of communion and baptism. You don't go to heaven because you get baptized. You don't go to heaven because you take communion. 
But we partake of these things because we have believed in Jesus. We have received him by faith. We know where we're going when we die. Communion, it means fellowship, and it speaks of our fellowship with God. God wants to be in fellowship with you. But you can't be saying, I'm going to bring all this stuff into his presence. No, no other idols before God. You can't bring your worldliness, your sins before God, unless you're going to repent of those things. Communion. We're going to partake of communion here in just a moment. But communion, it's the shocking reality that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, loves us. That's what communion is all about. God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price for all of our sins. He shed his blood as the only acceptable payment for our sins. What does baptism represent? Again, I'm a believer. I've received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to be identified with Christ in his death. That's when you go under the water. It's a symbol of his resurrection to new, newness of life. Why is it a public baptism? Because... You're saying to those who witness a baptism, I am not ashamed to be identified with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. I encourage you, next week we're going to have a baptism. I had a few people first service come up and say, I really want to get baptized. I didn't know what it was all about. You know, I went through the motions you know, 30 years ago. I didn't even understand what I was doing. But now I want to live for the Lord. If you haven't been baptized, or you don't even remember when you were baptized, then I want to encourage you to join us after church next week. But again, these two ordinances are only for followers of Jesus. Like the Passover, it says very clearly, there was one law for everybody, whether you're a Jew, a native-born, or whether you're a Gentile, a pagan. For salvation, there's only one way. There's only one door. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the final sacrificial Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If you're an unbeliever today, I encourage you to come to Christ. But you have to realize, and do you realize, I've sinned against the creator of the universe. I've sinned. I, I've missed the mark. I know what I deserve. Do you understand that there's nothing you can do to save yourself? There's nothing you can do to remain, uh, remove the stain of sin from your life. It's only when you know that to be true and that Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you and wash you, you know, clean, forgive you of all of your sins. When you understand that, he will come into your life. As many as call upon the name of the Lord will never be put to shame, will not be disappointed. Paul's so clear about that. Jesus even said, you know, I'm going to leave. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He will dwell in you. And then he says, the Father and I will dwell in you. And when we say, invite Jesus into your life, or invite him into your heart, I don't know where he lives, but he does. Literally comes inside of us. And he makes us a new creation in Christ. And he'll set you free. He'll give you a new beginning. And it's just like the people we're reading about here. Freedom and deliverance and a new life awaited them. But they had a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Am I going to stay in Egypt? Or am I going to go with God? Am I going to obey His voice? Am I going to follow the Lord? When you weigh it all out, it's really a no-brainer. There's only one option. You know, you look at the world, and, and, and as an unbeliever, I got to a point when I said, what is the world offering me? Hopelessness? Despair, a bunch of lies, a bunch of politicians who lie. I mean, what does the world offer us? Oh, it'll give you whatever you ask for. Just go for it. Go for the gusto. Your best life now. And you get to live to be 100 years old. Wow, that's a long, healthy life. Wow, 100 years old. And you die without Jesus. Where do you end up? In an eternal lake of fire away from the presence of God, where there's no light, there's no love, there's no forgiveness, there's no hope, there's no joy. But if you humble yourself before God, He will give you eternal life, never-ending joy. And above all, we get to be with God forever and ever in glory.